Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, good morning. Good morning, young friends. Good morning, Don, and good morning, David. Ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. It's 11.30, and uh, we are kicking off our session without uh, taking much further time. We have about 30 attendees already in the room. We expect others to join us as we proceed. Now, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to discuss briefly through this online media, the East African Court of Justice. I will request Don and uh, your worship to mute just briefly. Thank you, thank you so much. So ladies and gentlemen, this morning, we are going to be having a conversation around the East African Court of Justice. That's the regional court uh, established under the treaty establishing the East African community. To take us through this session, we are honored to host <coughs> the registrar of the East African Court of Justice, His Worship Yufnali Sokubo, who is basically the administrative head of the court, assisting the president, the principal judge, and the judges. He is the head of the secretary of, of, of the registry of the court, assisted with several staff. So he is the most suited to speak on administrative matters, on procedural matters, and to address queries you may have regarding generally uh, the East African Court of Justice. We are also honored this morning to host and to partner with Mr. Donald Dare, the Chief Executive Officer of the Pan-African Lawyers Union. As you know, Pan-African Lawyers Union is the umbrella uh, law society for national law society as well as regional bar associations across the African continent. We can call Palu the father of law societies in, in, in Africa. Don also happens to wear the hat of having been uh, the former Chief Executive Officer of the East African Law Society. Don served the East African Law Society at a time when the East African community was seeing major development, including amendment of the treaty that brought several changes to the court, including the introduction of the appellate division to the court. He thought the court had only one, you know, one body and it was called the East African Court of Justice. It was never first instance or appellate division. I believe Don and Euphrates will be sharing with us briefly about that history, what led to the change and the significance of that particular change. Because the session is very, very short, uh, we would limit uh, voice interaction from your end. We would suggest if you have questions you want addressed, please go to the board, type them there. We will see them and you can be assured we'll attend to them. If time allows later on, we'll, we'll be able to take one or two questions orally. Uh, at the moment, let me welcome uh, His Worship Yufnali Sokubo to kick us off with an introduction and, and to take us through briefly uh, the jurisdiction, composition of the court, and a bit on the rules of procedure. Later on, Don will come with a practitioner's perspective to the court. Welcome, Your Worship. Thank you, Huntington, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this new working uh, mode. Uh, others will have been meeting physically. Uh, the East African Court of Justice is your regional court. Um, owned by the East African community as an organ, the same way you have three organs of government in your national governments. Now this is the judicial arm of East African community, the six partner state, assuming that the six partner states are a country. The court's main jurisdiction is to deal with interpretations and applications of the treaty so that any violation of the treaty 
can be subjected to a court case, can be subjected to interpretation by the courts. However, maybe at this point, I should point out something which many of you may not know. You do not need to file a case in courts against a partner state or against an institution of the community because they have violated a certain provision of the treaty or a certain provision of a protocol. A violation of national laws by the national government that in itself is a violation of the treaty. Many people seem to connect that. They fail to appreciate that if a government passes laws, then does not respect those very laws violates, they fail to connect that that is also a violation of the treaty. Now it is a violation of the treaty because Article 6, 2, D and the 7, 2 talks about the rule of law. So where you don't uh, respect any law in your country, then by Article 6 of the Treaty and 7, you have equally violated the treaty. If lawyers were to open up their mind on that, I can assure you there will be very many cases filed in East African Court of Justice against the violations of the treaty. Now the court is composed of the treaty provides for a total of 15 judges, five in the appellate, and 10 in the first instance. But as of now, we have only five in the appellate. That means the appellate court is full, and six in the first instance. Uh, that means there is still room for more judges in the first instance. Why 10 and why five? 10, because it is in the first instance that most cases start. All cases actually start from there. So we are bound to have a lot of cases in the first instance than in the appellate. Secondly, it is not every case that goes to the first instance is appealed to. Many end up there to finality, parties are satisfied there, so there's no appeal. So that is why we have less judges in the appellate division and more in the first instance. But when this court was established, when it first came into force, it was what I call a one-chamber court. One chamber court, meaning you go there, you get your matter hard. If you lose, that's the end of it. If you win, you go away clapping. There was no room for appeal. Until around two or seven, when a certain case was brought from Kenya involving election of members of Ayala. Now what happened is that at the end of the case, the losers who are the government were not happy. And because they were not happy, and these were the government, they were agitated. Actually, the court gave an order stopping the summit. These are heads of state, remember. Stopping the summit from discussing a particular agenda on their agenda item, and they were not amused at all. So they said, uh, how can a court, judges they were appointed, stop them from doing their business? And they were advised, well, that is a court order. They wanted to appeal, they were told there's no room to appeal, so they gave instruction to the attorney generals to look for ways of amending the treaty so that there is room for appeal. That is the famous case of Anyang Nyong. Now it is out of that that then an amendment was, was uh, put in place, the treaty was amended to provide for an appellate division. And that created now the first instance and the appellate division, making the court at least now a two chamber court. If you lose in the first instance, you can go to the appellate division. So judges are appointed by the summit, at least two from every partner state. Uh, at the moment, it's only South Sudan that has one judge. And uh, now it, it does not have a second judge because the appellate division, the treaty still provides for five and it is full. So South Sudan only has one judge. The rest of the countries have two judges each. Then the court operates through rules of procedures. Recently, we amended the rules of procedure to make them more user-friendly. And as if we knew things might change, we provided for proceedings via use of information technology. When we were doing this, COVID had not started. But we were just looking ahead that this is where the world is going. Why can't we save litigants' cost of litigations? 
where we can have them hear the cases from wherever they are. So we have ended our rules. Then towards the end of the year, COVID comes in. This year makes things difficult that actually our rules where when we amend our rules to provide for the use of information technology, our rules have become very handy. Who can come to court? The treaty provides that any resident of the community, get me right, any resident of the community, not any citizen of the community. So a Chinese who is staying in East Africa and he has legal papers, he can come to court in the same way as you, an East African, can come to court. Now you can come to court sue a partner state. You can sue the Council of Ministers. You can sue an institution of the community. Those are the only parties you can sue. Of course, because the community has staff under the East African community, there's also a provision for staff to use the court where they feel there's something amiss, something disturbing about their terms of service or their contracts. Those are the main parties that can come to court. Other things like uh, preliminary rulings uh, can also come. What preliminary ruling simply means, and it is so much used in the European courts, is that at the national level, the national courts equally have jurisdiction to hear cases that touch on the interpretation of the treaty. So it is not just the East African Court of Justice that can do that. Even national court, there is concurrent jurisdiction can do that. But should the national court not be sure of what is in front of them, touching on the provisions of the treaty or on the protocols of the, or some of the protocols of the, in East African community, they can stop that proceedings, refer that case to the East African Court of Justice, what we call preliminary ruling, for the East African Court of Justice to make an interpretation of that provision. Remember, they will not hear the issues. They'll only interpret that provision. Once they have clarified that provision, then they send back the file to the national court where the matter came from for them then to proceed with the hearing. Now, uh, that provision of the treaty will have been clarified by the East African Court of Justice. Now, in our rules, any lawyer from an East African community can appear. It doesn't matter whether you were admitted yesterday. We don't have a role saying like, for example, only lawyers who have practiced for 10 years can appear. Even if you're admitted yesterday, you can still appear. So long as you file your practicing certificates. To file a case also in the East African Court of Justice, there is limitation period, like any other suits. Our limitation period is apparently 60 days very short for an international court. And again, there's a reason of, uh, behind that. The 60 days uh, was not out of judicial reasoning, I'll say so, but it was out of emotion. Again, this was out of emotion because during that Anyang Nyongo case, it was brought to, go to, to court almost a year after the bungled elections of members of Ayala in Kenya and the heads of state were saying, but if these things happened a long time ago, why did they come to court just the other day? And at that time, there was no provision for limiting the period within which one can file a case. So that is when the 60 days rule were introduced. You realize 60 days for an international court is very short. By the time you consult your lawyer, you gather evidence, you prepare papers, you may be caught up very easily by the 60, 60 days rule and quite a number of good cases have been lost because of this 60 days rule. Now, most of the cases we had ever since the court started have inched around Article 6 and Article 7. And out of that Article 6 and Article 7, about 90% of those cases have, have, have been around violation of human rights. That has led to people wondering, this is a court that was created by a community that is driven by integration. How comes the cases we are having are only human rights? Of course, one can say before you integrate, you must be sure about your human rights. So correct the human rights issue first, then when that is okay, you can integrate. But I can tell you also that since last year, we are seeing a lot of trade related cases being filed 
including one being filed yesterday against uh, one of the partner states. So the population is now moving. It's now aware that trade-related matters can actually be brought to the East African Court of Justice. And we're having quite a number and very interesting cases that are now going to shape the integration of the region. Now to file a case, you follow the rules of procedure through our references. Anybody who has had an experience of practicing under common law, you'll find the rules very simple and easy to go by. But since three weeks ago, all our proceedings are now online. We have developed some guidelines to guide the parties on online hearings. And so far yesterday we had one hearing. This morning we are just liaising with some lawyers for tomorrow's hearing uh, so that uh, COVID or no COVID, the, the, the wheels of justice should not ground to a halt. We also, when the matters go on appeal, they only go there on two main grounds, either on a point of law or on procedural irregularity. Of course, we have had issues where somebody files a review in the form of an appeal. Instead of arguing a review, he's actually arguing an appeal, and most of such cases have been lost. Once the matters are finished, as the standard uh, rule provides, costs are always awarded. The winning party will uh, file their documents for taxations, and they'll be awarded the cost, and the winning party will, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will be awarded, uh, will get his cost. Something also unique that came out recently out of the jurisprudence of the court is that now the court has been awarding damages. It took such a long time, more than 10 years for the court to award damages. And this was because of an interpretation in the treaty that was not clear as to whether the court can award damages or not. But the court recently was bold enough and in one of the cases it awarded damages, which I can tell you it was paid. That means that was a president set. And as lawyers, therefore, you should not feel shy away from filing a matter in ESEJ and saying I cannot, I cannot ask for cost, especially if you are asking, if you are acting for traders. I mean, to a business person who is integrating, what is the declaratory order going to help him? These are business people. They have lost money in business uh, because of acts or omission of a partner state, and they bring that partner state. For them to walk out with a declaratory order, honestly, you will not be helping them, neither will you be helping integration in East African community. Uh, Chair, maybe I'll need to stop there and I'll come in later to clarify some issues if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, I think that was uh, precise and, and, and to the point. Uh, I believe there are many questions that will be coming in uh, later in the day. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to invite uh, Mr. Donald Dare, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Pan-African Lawyers Union, a distinguished human rights and rule of law advocate uh, in the continent and a fierce proponent of the ESC integration. So Donald Dare will be giving us a practitioner's perspective, which I believe you'll appreciate much as practitioners, uh, his experience generally around the court and how he has dealt with some of the challenges around what uh, the registrars pointed out, like the 60, 60 days limitation, statutory limitation period, and even the issue of jurisdiction. So Mr. Dare, please share with us what you have for us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Session Chair, our colleague uh, Huntington Amo, uh, and thank you very much also, Your Worship, uh, uh, the Registrar Ifnali Sokubu and colleagues on the call. I'll try and keep it short because I think I've begun seeing questions coming in, and I think probably it would be more useful for us to deal with the questions coming from colleagues to make it more uh, live to them. 
But if I were to say uh, just some general remarks um, to just more or less um, uh, add on to what uh, the, the Honorable Registrar said, is that the East African Court of Justice is one of a regional system of courts. We have a regional, uh, a system of regional economic communities across Africa. And, and this did not just happen spontaneously. These were very clearly envisaged in the Lagos Plan of Action of the Organization of African Unity and in the Abuja Treaty for the Establishment of an African Economic Community. So it said that the regional economic communities will be building blocks uh, to an eventual African uh, economic community. And they therefore created a sui generis system of law. Uh, so it is not just the way international courts operate, and it's not the way national courts operate. So we created in Africa a regional system uh, in between the international and the national. And that is why, for instance, in none of these courts was there a requirement for exhaustion of local remedies, which is a requirement you'll find for most international courts that uh, you must exhaust local remedies. We don't have that in the regional courts. And then there was also no bar to direct access by the court uh, to the courts by ordinary citizens and, um, and legal and natural persons. You hear me? It's a problem is working from home. Yeah, so I would say that the East African Court has is the same one that uh, the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice had, is the same one as the SADC Tribunal had, except that for them lately, um, six years ago, direct acts by the citizens, and this has been challenged in a series of national uh, courts. I'd also just point out something else that um, the Honorable Registrar said, how come there were very many human rights and rule of law cases um, in the beginning, in the first 15 years of the life of the court? And I would say that that's just because business lawyers and trade lawyers are said it's very, very high, uh, it's very wide. Uh, it's about you proving that a provision of East African community law has been violated. That's potential very wide uh, and even when it comes to trade matters is to prove that any of this but our business and trade colleagues were actually very conservative for very long but lawyers activists for human rights and the jurisdiction of the court so we are actually quite glad that um, in uh, who practice business um, and corporate law and trade law uh, Don, coming to the court to Don, you, are, you are breaking we can hear you with 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 some breaks proceed we'll alert you in case we don't hear you at all i'm sorry okay so my point was uh it is good that in the recent past, in the last two, three years, we are seeing our colleagues who practice uh, business law, uh, trade law, relying more, coming more to the court for it to be able to business and trade law issues so that the court then has a more broader jurisprudence and a more broader reach. Um, I think Huntington Amola has spoken about the two month uh, limitation uh, sorry, uh, yeah, you asked it as a question, but all, it is actually a very difficult thing. First, it is discriminatory in that approach the jurisdiction of the courts. The states can come to court. Uh, staff of the East African community can come to court. Organs and institutions of the East African community can come to court. But the two months limitation was put only for legal and natural persons. So for the states, if they choose to, they can come even a year later. Uh, for staff of the community, they can come even a year later. 
but only for legal and natural persons was this put. So we find that discriminatory. It's also quite difficult in that we have tried to argue before the court, both uh, divisions of the court, on the principle of continuing violations, which in other international law systems has been accepted, that so long as a violation is contested or addressed, you begin counting afresh. But whereas other international uh, continue violations, the East African court has refused to do that. And I say they will uh, interpret very strictly uh, the provision of two months that was inserted belatedly by a treaty amendment in 2007 and only as against legal and natural persons. So for us or an organ or an institution of the community does some that we think is um, not in accordance with the law, there's really no time to try and seek an amicable settlement. There's no time to try and talk with them to try and see, can we resolve this thing? Because if 60 days pass, um, then uh, you can no longer sue. So we find that we have to rush to court whenever something wrong has happened without giving the states, the governments, the organs and institutions of the community some reasonable time to rectify it. So it's one of the things that I hope that going forward in terms of treaty amendments, we can get out of that provision and have a much more reasonable time limit so that it enables us to try and rectify things amicably before uh, going to, to, to court. Uh, but as it is right now, we find there are very limited opportunities. So sometimes there can be a major violation, but along the way, minor violations continue happening. So as at the time, we as lawyers are alerted to it by potential litigants, we then look for the latest transgression and use that to launch a case and then try and then give the background of the case, even if it stretches into a number of years, but focusing on the latest transgression, which happened within two months of we going to court. Sometimes it ends up limiting the full justice of the matter, but for the time being, that's the best uh, that we can do. I then see that our senior Evans Monari has asked a question. And his question is, is it possible to have an ESC regional strategy to combat this pandemic? Uh, and I would say, actually, the answer is suggested in the question. Yes, it is possible. And actually, to the best of my knowledge, there are a couple of measures being taken in that regard. It is, uh, sorry, I can see my internet is unstable again. It is uh, a bit unfortunate that our heads of state have not met at head of state level, uh, heads of state, in order to provide proper guidance and leadership from the front. We are hoping that will still happen. There has been a consultative meeting of four out of the six heads of state, and that's SADC as well. There has not been a full SADC summit, but there's been a consultative meeting that had more than half of the heads of state. But in ECOWAS, there's been a summit. In IGAD, I believe there's actually been two summits, the Intergovernmental Authority and Development. At the level of the AU, Whereas the full summit of 55 heads of state has not met, the Bureau, which is like the executive committee, made up of five heads of state, chaired by the chair of the AU, has had at least three meetings to be able to give direction from the front on the crisis. But be that as it may, uh, we have had at least two uh, meetings at the level of the ministers of the community they have issued guidance, uh, guidelines, operational guidelines on, um, on how to handle um, uh, the crisis. One thing that they have focused on thus far is to ensure that even those states have locked down their borders to reduce the movement of human beings across borders. They are intent on keeping the borders open for cargo so that essential uh, uh, goods, food, medicines, essential medical products, and so on can move. Uh, so they frequently uh, review this. So at least at the level of the ministers, guidelines and guidance have been issued, which the consultative meeting of the heads of state um, took note of. 
and we hope going forward we will see more of that. I also know that the East African Legislative Assembly, which is supposed to be the representative of the people and to exercise some uh, supervision over the executive arms of government, has met virtually and has committed to continuing to meet virtually. So I'm also hoping going forward that we'll see how the citizens, especially the business people, can also directly engage the East African Legislative Assembly so that it can help um, for them to ensure that decision makers take into consideration uh, the views uh, of citizens on how to manage the crisis that we have. We lead upon a regional health master plan, a regional health surveillance master plan, and they'd come up with a strategy for it and including a communication strategy for it. But I am not sure that it is being fully implemented. It almost looks like when the crisis came, that was set aside and the community is moving around in an ad hoc manner, trying to find out how to deal with what it's faced with. John, uh, we lost you. I see also, as we wait for our chair to, you know, to, to come back, I can see also a number of the comments that have come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying, well, yeah, I kind of tried to make some points and then kind of stop. But um, in answering our senior Evans Monari, I said that uh, while guidance has not come from the heads of state yet, at the ministerial level, there's been some guidance around the crisis. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you. Uh, I know there are so many questions coming in and uh, you've basically given a good uh, perspective uh, from somebody experienced working with the court. Uh, I would suggest that uh, we give uh, the registrar an opportunity to finish uh, part of his discussion this morning, then we can delve into the numerous questions that are coming through. So. Uh, the registrar will be coming back just now to address possibly the new rules, uh, highlight some of the procedural matters that uh, practitioners should focus on, as well as just give us a brief on how the online court system uh, and court filing or any such thing are working and, and any challenges that uh, practitioners should anticipate. We, we will then reserve a large share of our time today to address the very many questions that are coming through. Your Worship, please take your time. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Maybe just uh, a bit on the 60 days invitation period that Dawn has uh, mentioned about. You can see very well there that there is a discrimination there. Whereas I'm given 60 days to file a case, if it's a partner state or the Secretary General, he has all the time he needs. Yet, we are deemed to be equal before the law. So is there really access to justice there? That is a problem. Now going back to the courts, in this COVID-19 period, rule 133 and 132 of the rules of procedure allow for online procedures. You can file your matters online. Our case management system, we are still developing where you can file from wherever you are. But in the meantime, once your documents are ready, you just can them and send to us. I can show you the process on the same day and return back to you on the same day. The rules allow that. Immediately you receive them. We also allow, the rules allow for online service send to the other party by email and just as, pro as proof that you sent to the other side by email put us in copy thereafter you can use that email as part of your affidavit of service we will then process the documents prepare once you have served invite you for a scheduling conference again online Two to three days 
before that, we will get in touch with you. We will test the system, make you be comfortable with the system, advise you, for example, how to raise your hand, the same way I've seen here, the lighting, everything. And on the material day, you'll all be expected to log in at least 30 minutes before time, hearing time. The judges will then start coming in five to 10 minutes before the hearing. And the last judge to come in will be the president or the principal judge. And as soon as the president or the principal judge comes in, it will be announced the court is in session. All the trials we have had, I can assure you, they have been very, very successful. Before that, internally also, we prepare with documentation so that our court clerks are the ones who will share the documents on the screen for you so that if you are referring to your affidavits, it will be shared there by our court clerk. As you say, paragraph this, paragraph this, it'll be scrolling down for you to see. <clears throat> Thereafter, of course, the judges will retreat. And once they are ready with the judgment, again, we will notify you the date of the judgment. We will again test the system with you just to ensure it is okay. Uh, we ensure we received all the submissions that the judges have them, they have done it once they are ready with the judgment. Then again, with the judgment, the full panel doesn't have to be there because they'll have deliberated and agreed. So they can choose all of them to be there or only one judge will be present and then they'll deliver the judgment. <clears throat> now, after judgment has been delivered, one of the questions has been, how do you enforce the court orders or the decisions of the, of the, of the East African Court of Justice? Now, ESCJ, like any other international court, doesn't have a mechanism for enforcing their court orders. We even saw this fugitive. It is not the Rwanda Tribunal or the ACC that, uh, that, uh, that uh, enforced the warrant. They had to, to seek assistance, for example, with the government of France. But Article 38.2 says every partner state shall take all steps as soon as possible to enforce or to accept or to implement a judgment of the courts. That therefore means that a partner state whose where judgment has been passed against them, if he fails to obey the decision of the court is in itself a violation of the treaty. In fact, we had a case where costs were awarded against a litigant the partner states refused to pay. That litigant sued them again, saying how it was a violation of Article 38.2, and the court agreed it was a violation, and they awarded him more costs. But I think thereafter that partner state must have paid because the, the litigant never came back to us. Secondly, if it is, let's say, a monetary, a money judgment, you send that judgment or order to the country where you are enforcing that order. That country upon receiving it will refer it back to us to, for me to certify that yes, indeed, this is our court order. I will certify it and send it back to that country. And as soon as it gets there, it will be received, sealed as if it is a judgment of that partner state and the normal execution procedures in that particular country will follow. So I've said service, you can use online service. It's not a problem. Uh, since the physical is not, uh, is not possible, filing, you can file using IT. Because we are still, uh, we, have, we have a bit of a problem with our case management system, scan the documents that are sent to us, we will, uh, we will, uh, we will process them. I have also seen a question on certificate of agency. That is a matter that is being addressed and very soon we hope uh, all certificate of agency matters will be, will be dealt with. Uh, maybe just before I stop, uh, allow me to comment on uh, Senior Council Bonari's question about regional approach. In my personal opinion, maybe we should have closed all the custom unions borders so that we have one big country called ESC. Then with, 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 the, with the standards 
all the six countries have equal standards. That will enable movements within ESC to have been very easy. Maybe even local flights within ESC will have been going on. We will still have been able to move within ESC if we all add standard procedures. But as you know, something seemed to have gone amiss somewhere. I know our heads of state are trying very, uh, very much, as uh, Don has explained, four of them met, and very soon we hope things will be, will, be, will be cleared out. As this was happening, it is during such times that you find uh, there's likelihood of violations of the treaty. And that is why I said very recently we are receiving a lot of cases coming in from almost all the partner states challenging certain actions of partner states that are saying are violations of the treaty. Uh, uh, you'll hear about these cases. Uh, if you go to our website, you can also get some of them. I would also like to mention that uh, if you go to our website, you will get the guidelines for video conference hearings, which are very clear on what is supposed to do, what is expected of, of you, clarifying most of the things that I've said here. And even all those new cases that I'm talking about, you'll also be able to peruse them there and see how the regional uh, uh, regional attention litigation in the East African Court of Justice is changing. Uh, maybe we'll stop there, Chair. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you for that uh, clarity and uh, even trying to address some of the pertinent questions that are coming up uh, for discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this point, uh, we will be going through the questions you've raised. Uh, feel free, at any particular point, you may raise your hand, and if there's room, then we may allow you to also make a contribution, as we understand that uh, you also have something that you may contribute here. So as the discussion goes on, if you feel you have a contribution you can make, you can raise your hand or continue posting it. So Your Worship uh, and Don, I've seen you've answered some questions that have been raised. Uh, I'll just sample some of them. And uh, Your Worship, uh, I think uh, there's a need to clearly discuss uh, the matter of the certificate of agency. Uh, as I raised it with you uh, this week, there are concerns uh, that East Africa Law Society keeps uh, recording from our members who have filed cases as far as 2019 and have, the certificates have not been listed for hearing. And as you understand, uh, most times uh, we come to the East African Court of Justice in desperate situations when the states have already muzzled the little that our clients are able to master. So would we understand clearly and for the benefits of members, what is causing the challenge? Is it about uh, the erratic and, 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 and uh, you know, spaced out court, court sessions? Is it about availability of personnel? Or is it a procedural challenge? Or is there a substantive you know, reason behind the challenge of certificate of agencies? And within what period would somebody reasonably expect a certificate of agency to be listed for hearing? I think we can, uh, and Don, uh, you can also feel free to add your voice on, 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 on your experience around this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, on the issue of certificates, the fact that it is called a certificate means it must be given priority. Doesn't matter how busy the court is. In my personal opinion, I think it is not even a, if, if, even a, a structural issue because the court sits in session. Uh, that to me cannot be an excuse for certificates not, uh, not being dealt with. It may be more of an internal logistic issue. Now, the treaty says the principal judge will be in charge of all the matters of first instance division. And the president, besides being the head of the court, will be in charge of all the matters of appellate division. That being in the treaty, it means the decision of when to hear certificates is mainly on the shoulders of the principal judge who manages affairs of the first instance division. It may require a lot of concerted efforts, both from within and outside, 
to have this matter resolved. And I'll call upon all of you, if you can do anything to have these results, maybe it will help. Because I don't see why a certificate personally should stay in court for over a year without being had. It, it defeats the whole purpose of certificate. Yet it is something provided in the rules of procedure. It is something provided even in the national uh, rules of procedure. That is why it is called a certificate. I'm looking at some of the questions. How is the court helping junior lawyers in getting experience in international litigations? We afford intern services for lawyers who are interested. We also try to do sensitization programs to teach lawyers on what happens to the ESCJ and how they can practice in ESCJ. I think last year we had such conferences in Kenya workshop in Kenya and Uganda. And quite a number of young lawyers came there to learn what is happening. And I can assure you even from Uganda, immediately we left there, there was a case that was filed from Uganda out of that workshop. Sensitizing states on the mandate of the court, yes. Sensitization is a tricky issue because it involves funds. And uh, finance has, a, has been one of the very thorny issues in the community. In fact, in all the organs of the community, other than institutions, our budget is not that big. We have to rely on donors who once in a while sponsor sensitization programs here and there. But on the other hand, also some ministries of ESC have been very active. They organize sensitization programs in their countries, and they have been inviting us to go there and tell the public and the lawyers who are attending about the East African Court of Justice. Uh, another question is about uh, give practitioners a time indication on how soon they can expect directions on certificate of urgency. I think I've dealt uh, with that. Do advocates have to consent to witness statement being allowed without calling the witnesses? That is a choice of the parties. You might want just to put in your witness statement or you might want to bring in the witness himself to give oral testimony. The rule allows for both. During scheduling conference, you can agree whether you will call a person to come and give a viva voza, viva voza evidence or his statement will be sufficient. Uh, mutual recognition of decisions of other regional and international courts, yes. The mechanism is uh, the usual one of uh, if a matter was dealt by European Court of Justice, touching and more or less the same matters of what is before the court in East African Court of Justice, you will find the court relying on that decision. Though persuasive, but because the facts are more or less the same, it will be followed. That has never been an issue. If you read most of our decisions on our website, you'll find that has been followed very, very much. Sorry, there's a question that has jumped. Integration of mediation, court next mediation. Now, court next mediation is not in our rules of procedure. Although sometimes it is encouraged during, uh, during scheduling conference, where parties are asked if they think they can mediate and solve the problem. So far, we have never had any matter that reached a scheduling conference and parties went for mediation. The court tries to encourage, but because it's not in our rules, we have never had an instance where that has been done. In the absence of collaboration among EAC member states on combating the pandemic, only shows the loopholes. I think that is a comment, it's not a, a question. When will the court establish a registry? Now, South Sudan sub registry. This is a matter I've been following for a very long time. Initially, initially, South Sudan were unable to provide space. They said there was a building that was behind the chief, just the, the high court that was being renovated. In December, when I was in uh, Juba, the building had been renovated and there is a room or two rooms or a, sec a, good, a good area that is allocated to us. We are, however, waiting for some formalities from the Republic of South Sudan before we officially come there and establish that office. On our part, we are ready. Actually, if the, if the, if the person who has this question is from there, it will also help push by seeing the Chief Justice there and ask them what is happening. 
We are waiting for some official communication from the government of South Sudan about our registry, and we will be ready to set up that office. Those are the questions I can see on uh, question and answer forum. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Don, we can give Don a chance to also take on some of the questions. I know there's a particular question or two of them uh, that uh, we can take after Don has also gave, given his contribution. That is the question uh, regarding the, 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 the trend of cases coming up before the court, whether there are uh, trade matters or business matters that are uh, being taken up by the court and basically the reason behind the trends. And I think that can be dealt with later. And then I would also think that uh, the practitioners themselves would want to have some contribution regarding the, 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 the point you raised earlier that if there's something we can contribute as practitioners towards handing the quagmire around the certificates of agencies, then you welcome it. So I believe some practitioners, I've seen indications, they might have some contributions to make on this. Don, please have your take on some of the questions. Thank you very much, Huntington. I hope of, uh, every time I begin speaking, it tells me the internet is unstable. I don't know why it's letting me down today. It's been behaving pretty well this month, but <laughs> for some reason, Murphy's Law is playing on me and internet today. Uh, I think I'd just like to, to emphasize two points, which I think uh, the Honorable Registrar has already made anyway. On the issue of diversity of the cases, the issue really falls on lawyers. It's about the imagination of the lawyers. And as I said, for reasons that I don't understand, the corporate and commercial lawyers were initially slow to come to the court, even for cases where they could. Indeed, in corporate and commercial law, usually it's two private parties suing each other. And there's that limitation that this is not a court of appeal per se. This is a court of ensuring uh, adherence to the treaty. So you can really only sue the partner states or you can do uh, organs and institutions of the community. But indeed, in my view, especially for those that represent companies or businesses that trade across borders, many of whom in the course of doing their business would face what we call non-tariff barriers, where a sister government or a sister governmental agency is putting in place measures which go against the treaty, uh, which violate, uh, uh, you know, commitments um, that they have made, which are harming businesses, that that is something that can be brought for adjudication. So it's surprising we haven't seen more of that. Uh, another area that, in my view, that touches on business law, that uh, we, we could, in principle, see a lot of cases around immigration. And uh, the legal regime of the common market there's supposed to be freedom of movement uh, uh, of East Africans with rights of residence, you know, and rights of establishment. And many times on a case-by-case -case basis, we find East Africans, just like other non-East Africans, being denied a work permit. Yet our legal regime says we should now be treating fellow East Africans the way we treat our nationals. So I would have imagined we'd see more of litigation on that area, more of formal complaints on that area, but I haven't seen that yet. So I think it is up to us and our imagination in how we can frame disputes um, that um, are, are amenable to resolution against the partner states or against various organs and institutions of the community. Indeed, even on this issue of COVID, I am certain eventually litigation will come where the states will be asked that don't you have uh, under the treaty an obligation to cooperate? Haven't you passed subsidiary instruments around health management and around economic management? What did you do and when did you do it? Was it soon enough? Uh, I'm certain we'll see that. Uh, and then also just to emphasize again on the issue of um, uh, certificates of urgency, more or less the realm of interim orders of the court. Again, I think it is just our role as users of the court to keep on pestering the court and also persuading the court that it has the jurisdiction and the law to issue urgent interim orders and that it has actually done so. 
um, if I remember correctly, and I can look in my notes while we're in plenary MC, in the Nyongo case, the classical case, the Nyongo case, the case that led to uh, a suspension of the swearing in of uh, East African Legislative Assembly members uh, pending a hearing on the merits. The decision, I think, was issued within three days of the filing. So we come from a history when the court actually knew it could act quickly. Part of the reason the system of the treaty says the president of the court shall be fully resident uh, at the seat of the court and the principal judge shall be fully resident is really so that they can handle urgent interim matters in addition to handling administrative matters. So it's just for us to push and persuade them that when you see a matter brought before you that on the face of it is urgent, you are entitled to act, even if it has not been specifically requested. But especially when there's an application for urgent interim orders before you, you cannot wait three or four months until the full bench is constituted to then hear it. Uh, and best practice on this, there's very good practice from the African court. Don, we lost you. you you'll have to step back a bit. I think we've lost okay. a chunk of, of, of wisdom from you there over the last, right. what okay. you've said over the last 30 seconds. You might have to go Sorry. over it and, yes. Okay. Just carry on. I will just again slowly and then, uh, you know, open up for, for interactive, for comments from our colleagues. There's good practice from the African Court on Human and People's Rights, which issues provisional me measures urgently, even when parties have not specifically asked for it. So when a case is filed before them and it looks like something might uh, uh, be irreparably uh, changed, the court has issued urgent interim orders to Omoto. So it's just about persuading and pushing uh, the East African Court of Justice that it can do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I think uh, we can give uh, the registrar a chance to also comment uh, on, on the very last uh, matters that, that you are touching on. That is uh, the issue of... of, of uh, Thank you, thank you, Chair. Maybe let, let me just explain something that from 2016, the number of cases being filed in the first instance are really, really, really going up. As the numbers increase, the number of judges remain the same. A panel can be five or three. More often than not, there have been five. Now, we have been having six judges of the, appeal, of the first instance division where we could have two panels of 3-3. Three, three. But in the process, one judge retired and is not replaced to death. That is one problem. Cases going up, number of judges being the same. The second question is that these sessions where judges come to Arusha for 30 days. And remember, they come to Arusha for 30 calendar days. It does not mean working or being in court for 30 calendar days. If you look at the actual days of working, they're only 21. The rest are weekends. Now, 21 days, number of cases going up. It's a problem. What have I done? I have written several papers to the Council of Ministers explaining to them why judges should be permanently in Arusha giving the statistics of the number of cases, where we were 10 years ago, where we are now, with 21 days of people to work in Arusha. It's very difficult. Besides that, I have even tried to play around with the budget so that to make them sit more than the 21 days, so that instead of them coming for 30 days, sometimes they come one and a half months just for them to try and clear some of that backlog. But there's again another problem to that. Four years back, our budget was more than the budget I have today. So budget is going down, workload is increasing, staff are increasing. When South Sudan came in, it meant what? Another judge comes in, but the budget is going down and the cases are going up. So you can see that problem. Now today, I'm yet to receive 
a feedback from the Council of Ministers on our proposal. We did a very good cost-benefit analysis of having the judges permanent and them coming the way they come after every two months. I mean, actually, 27 days in a quarter, 27 days in a quarter. We did a cost-benefit analysis. And the difference was not much. I think it was about $5,000 only. Anybody should be able to see it is for the benefit of everybody to have these judges permanently in Arusha. If they were there permanently, then all these problems of certificates, matters delaying, will not, will, will not have taken, uh, will not have reached the level at which, uh, which we are. Appellate, we don't have that problem. First of all, as I said, not every case goes uh, to the appellate division. So the workload is, is, is very, very manageable. But uh, again, as I say, we need a concerted effort from both of us. When, 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 when uh, justice is delayed like that, and particularly from an international court, it does not reflect well. That in itself may be a violation of the treaty. Maybe the court is also violating a treaty by not hearing matters that are filed by certificate of urgency. It's against the rule of law. Uh, any suggestion from you, both of you, will be very much uh, welcome on how far we can push this. But you can see the efforts I've done, because I can see all these things coming, all the matters pass, pass across me. How do you keep reducing a budget, and the number of staff is going up, and the number of cases is going up? So maybe I should also tell them, then my output, my output should also go down, because they're not giving me uh, sufficient funds. Donors have tried helping, but you know there are certain things donors cannot fund. Like donors cannot fund the operation of the judges. Uh, how will a judge feel? Maybe he's being carried, carried, carried in a vehicle that was bought by a donor. And you know donors always insist on the uh, visibility. So they'll put there, these vehicles donated by it can't. Certain things they can do, certain they can't, they only have to be done by our partner states who set up this court. They know why they set it up, they knew they wanted it, they know the importance of these courts. So please let us work together. If you can help also from whatever angle you can do to, 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 to help us solve some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, the contributions uh, are, are making it uh, a bit clearer on some of the questions that were raised. Uh, Don, uh, as a practitioner, I know there's a challenge that uh, we always deal with, uh, the question of jurisdiction. It is not as clear as we want to make it. I've seen a number of cases uh, which look to me on the face of them as you know, properly invoking jurisdiction of the court, being dismissed for want of jurisdiction. And uh, at the back of my mind, I have questions of human rights, questions of probably trade, uh, and some matters which are basically involve violation of, of municipal laws. So as a practitioner, from your experience, uh, what, what, would you, what would your comment be regarding jurisdiction and uh, how you normally navigate to ensure that uh, when drafting, you properly invoke this jurisdiction, that is the jurisdiction of the court to interpret and compel enforcement of, of treaty obligation. Um. Actually, I think the best answer to that question is more in terms of engaging with colleagues uh, from across the region to say, let's improve the diversity of cases that come before the court. I mean, this court is also a young court. 20 years is actually young. And 10 years ago, I mean, 15 years ago, five years ago, it was even younger. So it still has to negotiate, in a sense, its acceptability and its respectability amongst the states. And states don't like implementing tough decisions, even from national courts. And I'll give you a very good example. In Uganda, the executive has ordered the police and the military to invade the courts on at least two occasions, and parliament on at least one occasion. In Kenya, when the Supreme Court made a decision annulling the presidential election results, we had very unpresidential remarks from our president. We got an open threat to revisit the court, 
and indeed we've seen measures being taken which arguably you can say are revisiting the court in terms of trying to, to, to reduce its, its um, reach and independence. So states bristle at having to implement decisions that they don't like. And when other branches of law don't avail themselves of a court, and therefore it's mostly human rights lawyers pummeling case after case after case on human rights, pushing states to the edge, then you can see the states will resent even more uh, and the court itself will try and mute what it says. And the real resolution to that, in my view, is have a diversity of cases, including business cases, which are easier to implement, which states are more amenable to implement. Then we form a strong track record of implementation of decisions of, decisions of all kinds. So actually, I think it is more in that regard. But apart from that, as I said, many times when the court, in my view, is trying to run away from something, they'll very, most probably try and catch you on the two-month limitation. So then, as I said, when I'm framing, when a client comes to me, when a person comes to me who uh, thinks that um, they have a case, I really ensure that I very strongly um, base the matter uh, on something that has happened in the last two months and I form a strong argument around that even though I can then go back in time and build an entire history by way of laying a background an entire history of the matter from when it started even if it started 10 years ago but I have to struggle very hard to build it on something that has happened in the last two months I've seen a case or two, some of which I can't really talk about the seal sub judice because they're in the court of appeal, where you can see the court saying, no, 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 no. We cannot inquire into something that's been done, you know, by a national constitutional court. But we're challenging those now in the appellate division. And I think even previous jurisprudence of the court, both the first instance division and the appellate division has been very clear that so long as you engrave your case on a provision of East African community law, the treaty protocol subsidiary to the treaty or law under that, that the court is entitled to hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, I think uh, that, is, that is something that uh, keeps on coming up uh, with, with many people asking, uh, how am I sure that this is a matter that is fit uh, to be taken before the court? And I think your contribution on the fact that uh, we are not seeing many practitioners coming up with diversity of cases. I think this is something that we've been raising in, in, our, in our series as we go around training in the region, uh, requesting our members to come forward and ensure that you know, they bring as many cases and as diverse as possible. I think one of the major challenges we've seen is lack of uh, any, any significant matter around cross-border trade uh, being, being brought before the court. The court essentially, has been litigate, uh, has been determining more of rule of law cases on on national events as opposed to cross border activities, and this primarily because uh, practitioners are not taking uh, advantage of of the window that is available. But again, you'd also understand the frustration to the extent that if you are to file a certificate, a matter under certificate, as I know others have done, and then you have to wait for three four months before getting any direction on it then basically you get discouraged by that particular system. But I believe based on the discussion today, then we are seeing a pointer. Uh, even as I move to the next question, I'd want to clarify that uh, as the East African Law Society, the Governing Council is already taking a step uh, regarding the delays in certificates uh, and delays in fixing some, some matters for hearing. And uh, we are going to have a conversation with the leadership of the court, including the registrar, the principal judge, and the president in the coming week to raise some of these questions. So I'll request that if you have a matter uh, that has been pending hearing, pending listing, whether it's certificate or just an, an ordinary matter, please reach us, communicate with us, and we are, we, we'd want to find those details so that we base our discussion and conversation with the court leadership on tangible uh, materials and not 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 just rumors. 
Now, Your Worship, uh, a question has come through regarding uh, the court sessions uh, that uh, the court calendar is not available freely outside there. Uh, how do we know uh, what times the court will be sitting, what matters are coming up? And uh, that question is tied uh, with one regarding uh, rotational uh, sittings that uh, is, will the court still be sitting in Arusha for a long time or is there a plan for us to see the court moving around in the spirit of integration across the East African region and tied with whether Arusha is now a permanent seat of the court or the permanent seat of the court will be moving to another East African uh, community partner state. Now, uh, the issue of the court rotating, those who can remember, there's a time the court sat in Dar es Salaam. And also it sat in uh, Nairobi. In every year of my budget, I always include that component, but unfortunately my budget gets reduced. A case like uh, the my famous Mabirizi case from Kampala, that would have been a very good case to be conducted uh, in Kampala. But due to budgetary provisions, you are unable to do that. Our rules have always had that. It is something I would really want to do, but unfortunately, I can't. Now, the seat of the court is temporarily in Arusha. This has been one very long transition provision of the treaty. Currently, as we speak, the matter is before the summit. We are expecting during the next summit, a decision will come up as to whether the court is moving or, uh, or not. Of course, that also comes back with another challenge that if we are there temporarily, it even becomes difficult to approach a donor for any assistance. Let's say if it was infrastructure assistance, the donor will tell you, but now you want me to give you money to do this, then tomorrow you'll be moving. What happens? That is a challenge and uh, it is something we are all looking forward to it being solved because it is a summit that determines where, 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 a court, where an institution or an organ of the community is, uh, is to be located. I hope I've covered everything on that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There was the, the, the schedule of the court sessions. As I said earlier, the first instance and the appellate uh, division, they sit once in every quarter over here. That means every four months, once, once, once. Uh, January, we always leave it free because people are just coming back. February, we always have the appellate division and uh, followed by the first instance division. That sequence continues until November because we're closing the year. We have both divisions in Arusha sitting concurrently. But if you go to our website, you'll also get that schedule. We always post it there. So you can always check it around there. However, it is not cast in stone. Sometimes we do have extraordinary sessions when there are certain matters that uh, need to be concluded quickly, especially now when we know quite a number of judges are leaving. I think uh, next month, two of the judges in the appellate division will be finishing their contract. That will leave the appellate division with only three judges, not unless others are appointed between now and then. Come the end of the year, the principal judge and the president will also be leaving. So sometimes when we know judges are about to end and we have some money, we hold extraordinary sessions to try and clear part hard matters with those judges so that once they go, then we don't have to go to bring them. So it is on our website, uh, but it's not cast in stone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would want you to, you and Don, to mull over two issues. One, regarding the protocol on extended jurisdiction. Uh, there's a question regarding it. Uh, probably you'll highlight to us what that protocol is uh, and the status as of now. And uh, briefly about the arbitration jurisdiction of the court. Uh, uh, even as you think uh, of whether your response on that, how great is on. Kalal is 
Tevin, are you able to unmute and ask your question, Kalali? Kalali Steven? Please unmute, unmute your microphone and, and ask your question. Meanwhile, uh, at the addresses with technological challenges, uh, Don and, 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 and your worship, uh, please uh, tell us about the protocol on extended jurisdiction. We've heard so much about it. What is it? Uh, where is it? And what is the benefit to practitioners? And when are we expected to reap those benefits? And your worship too, uh, briefly tell us about arbitration jurisdiction, which I think uh, would be able to unlock the commercial uh, uh, dispute potential of the court. Okay, the protocol on extended jurisdiction. The purpose of that protocol was to extend the jurisdiction of the court so that the court can hear matters that are emanating from implementation of the customs union protocol and the common market protocol. Any dispute arising out of implementation of those two protocols then that protocol is supposed to give jurisdiction to the courts. That is one. Where is it? This protocol, upon being signed by the heads of state, it went to the countries for ratification. To my recollection, I think I've seen only one ratification. That is from Kenya. Now, the situation in ESC is that all partner states must ratify a protocol before it comes into force. So a protocol, as good as it may, it can even take 20 years before it comes into force because it cannot come into force until all partner states have ratified it. To me, that is wrong. Even where I was working in other regional organizations, out of eight members were saying, if four signed ratify a protocol, the protocol comes into force. So that is where it is. But on the other hand, the benefits of this protocol, I don't think you need to wait for this protocol for you to enjoy the benefits. Because already the court is hearing matters that are arising out of the violations of the common market and customs union protocols. Matters have been filed arising from that, and the court has been seized of the jurisdiction. Why? Because the court is the one with the powers jurisdiction to do with all matters pertaining to interpretation of the treaty. And protocols are annexes to a treaty. So why do you need another document to give jurisdiction to the court when a protocol is merely an annex to the treaty? That matter, nobody has raised uh, that issue incidentally on all the matters that have come to court, touching on the violation of the customs union and common market protocol. So don't wait. I will encourage lawyers, it is there. You benefit from it right away. Don't wait for its, for, 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 for its uh, coming into force. Personally, I think I, we don't need that protocol. Ask me, I'll tell you we don't need that protocol. Because the court has jurisdiction to deal with all matters pertaining to interpretation of the treaty. And, and the protocols are, are mere annexes to the treaty. So they are part of the treaty. You really don't need it. That is one. Arbitration, the court has jurisdiction also to do arbitration matters. This can come where in a commercial agreement you gave that jurisdiction to ESCJ or you created, you can even amend your commercial agreement to have uh, to, uh, to appoint ESCJ as the court, as, as, as the institution that will uh, determine your disputes. We are therefore just an arbitration center like any other arbitration center. Of course, many people have said, but these are judges. How are they again sitting as arbitrators? Yes, although they are judges, they have undergone training in arbitration under the Chartered Institute of Arbitration. They do the same exams like any other arbitrator. And those who pass, pass. 
So they are qualified as arbitrators besides being, uh, being judges. And almost half of them now are chartered arbitrators. And we have had quite a number of arbitration cases going on. Uh, of course, you'll not see that on our website uh, or being given publicity because arbitration by their nature, they are private proceedings. But we have got quite a number of, uh, of, uh, of arbitration matters being had there. At the risk of being told I'm, I'm watching for the court, you have quite some advantages if you decided to use the court as your arbitration place. You don't pay the arbitrators. You don't pay for the for the for the for the arbitration rooms. All of those are provided there. In in in, in the what your your partner state paid the, the membership. All that are provided. So it will really make uh, that process of litigation a bit cheaper uh, than the normal other other arbitrations. So we encourage people to try and use it also. It's also good to have many arbitration centers in the region. As, as, as most matters now, uh, people are preferring to use, uh, to use arbitration uh, instead of a uh, court, which everybody has been complaining, they take long, they are quite winding, they are what and what and what and what. So it is up to you, the lawyers and their clients themselves to make, uh, to make a choice. Maybe Dawn uh, might add in something. I mean, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Honorable Registrar. I'll just say that, I'll just, uh, I think more or less emphasize what you've said, that with regard to the arbitral jurisdiction of the court, it's more upon we, the parties, to call upon it. So when we're drafting contracts and we have to put in an arbitration clause that we ourselves consider putting a clause there that should there an issue arise, let the court meet as an arbitrator rather than as an adjudicator the rules of court to enable that exist. And I'd also like to challenge on that one our member states, because in other spheres, we're facing as citizens real problems with this issue of um, investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, where when states are going into bilateral agreements uh, with institutions or they're going into agreements um, with big contracts, um, in uh, mining, oil and gas, in um, huge infrastructure contracts and so on, they then oust the jurisdiction of the courts and say that these things shall be resolved uh, in arbitral tribunals, many of which are outside not only the country but the continent, and that which operate with a cloak of um, secrecy, confidentiality, Yet these are natural, uh, national resources. So I think we also need to challenge our states that can we see you using more regional international tribunals on issues of investor, investor state dispute settlement rather than you know, uh, shadowy you know, uh, bodies uh, or institutions based way out there in the global north that we have no control of. So I think the challenge goes back to us. And I think I'd just like to ask my colleagues that we've raised a number of issues, but just like in the national system, uh, it's not always that the only way to resolve these issues is through adjudication. I think we should also be engaging the East African Legislative Assembly, for instance, on questions of what is the budget that's available to the court, you know, and stuff like that. That's an area in which we can get a lot of traction, a lot of uh, positive publicity by engaging um, uh, the assembly. Uh, I think questions have arisen around amendment of the treaty. I myself have raised the issue that when the East African community restarted in 2001, we were only three partner states, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. And therefore, it made sense for the quorum rule in the treaty and in the rules of procedure of the assembly to say all heads of state. Thereafter, in 2007, we invited our colleagues from Rwanda and Burundi, and in the recent past, uh, from South Sudan. And there's a possibility that other states will also be invited into the East African community. So I think in terms of urgent treaty reform, that issue of the two-month limitation to filing cases by legal or natural persons should be amended, and at the very least put at a year, 12 months, you know, and the issue of the quorum of the institutions should also be amended 
so that we say if two thirds are there, then a meeting can proceed and decide rather than a situation where only one state out of the six can paralyze the business of the community by refusing to turn up at a meeting and therefore there is no quorum and nothing can be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, I think uh, there's one uh, of our participant, Faith Mashari, I've seen your hand is up. Uh, would you please unmute and then proceed to make your contribution? Faith? Can you hear me now? Please proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, Your Worship, and uh, Mr. Dea for your, for your contribution in this session. It has been quite helpful. I did have a couple of concerns on the issue of certificate of urgencies, which I posted uh, as questions. And uh, um, I'm glad for the answers and efforts that have come from the panelists in attempts to address those questions. I'm also glad that the CEO of the East African Law Society, who's our chairman today, has informed the attendees today that he's taking up the issue and he'll be meeting with the president of the East African Court of Justice and the principal judge to try and resolve the quagmires on the issue of certificate of urgency. So we wish you a fruitful uh, me uh, meeting and hopefully the issue will be solved. Kindly keep us updated and involved where you think we could add value to the negotiations. We really want to, to, to to make use of the court, but this issue is proving to be a big hindrance and we look forward for it, for it being resolved as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Uh, I think uh, there's another contribution. Abdul Nasir, please unmute and proceed. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Donald. Hello. We can hear you, we can hear you. Please proceed. Yes, uh, so my issue was about the, <coughs> the unfortunate dismissive uh, uh, approach to the protocol. Eh? I just want to say that uh, different jurisdictions have, uh, have embraced the protocols in a way that uh, it gives them a framework to approach uh, different uh, legal fronts. Eh? So it is quite unfair to hear that, uh, that the protocol uh, might not be that useful in terms, as long as the treaty cannot uh, operate in isolation of the protocol. So the protocol is much more of a, I would say the, the skull that adds the flesh and meat to the, to, the, to the already framework that we have in terms of the treaty. I think that is what I wanted to raise. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Abdul Nasir. Uh, your contribution uh, regarding the role of protocol is taken in, and I think uh, uh, our two able panelists will, will make a comment on that. Uh, Faith has also highlighted uh, uh, the issue of certificates, uh, which uh, I think she has noted the, the, the marked contributions from the panelists. So your worship and Don, uh, as you take on uh, the question of, of, of uh, or, or the contribution of Abdul Nasir on, on the protocol, which I think we had been probably just a clarification, I would also want to just hear something regarding the online hearing, uh, online court system, uh, your worship specifically. Uh, as we know, if it's online, then we do expect that we should be able to file our matters online without printing out papers, and we should be able to get our summons online without having to wait for one ship from Arusha. If we have to, if we are to be, you know, if, if we can serve it online. Does the system support, do the rules support online filing as well as issuance of summons online? And secondly, uh, there was a question about uh, witness statements. And I think uh, that contributor's concern was that uh, there's no framework ideally on how uh, witnesses will be engaged during an online hearing. Uh, as you know, it is the deep duty of the registrar of the court to ensure that where a witness uh, you know, statement or where disposition taken out of the physical court premises, then the integrity of that witness has to be guaranteed. That is the systems they are going to be used that we are able to properly administer. So if a litigant today 
attending an online hearing chooses to present witnesses to court, how are they going to do it on the online platform? That would be the second consideration. Uh, thank you, Chair. If you look at Rule 132 and Rule 133, it allows you to do everything from beginning to the end online, if you, if you want. In fact, we are encouraging that to stop this paper business. Now, the current system we have, court uh, case management and uh, recording system, it was only lacking uh, one item, that is online fighting, which is being developed now. Uh, of course, I've had other issues with that, uh, with that system. The, the, some of the primary users have found it very difficult to use the system because they still want physical things. But you are getting that over that uh, with the time. So if you find your, your, your documents online, the same same day you'll get them back with uh, someone to go and serve. And once also you, you, you serve online, he, he, the system will be able to reflect. In fact, if I go like right now on the case management system, and a certain my and one of my staff has not done anything which he was supposed to do. His name will appear in bold. That will be telling me either he has not filed some papers or there's an action he has not taken. The system is that good. It's only embracing it that has been a problem at the court level. But for you outside, you can really do it. You can use it. And just before, before the online filing system is fully working, as I said, just can the documents are sent everything will be good. Now, if you look at the guidelines we have issued on a video conference hearing, there isn't much said about witnesses, although I'm developing witness protocol right now, which is going to be online very soon. That will specify uh, how the witness will conduct himself, the room he'll be using, the surrounding place, the swearing in uh, the oath of the, of the witness, the documents he will refer to, uh, the cross-examination and uh, re-examination re until the witness finishes uh, his testimony. So we are coming up with a witness protocol uh, which will be followed during the, the, the online hearing. In the next two, three days, it should be on our website. We took note of that or not of that. In fact, in the next hearing of the first instance division, which is starting on the uh, 15th of June, we have two cases where witnesses will be testifying. So we are preparing for that. And I hope when that time comes, uh, we'll be ready and we won't have any problem. You realize uh, sometimes it may be difficult for a witness to understand that he's sitting in Kampala and where he's sitting is considered a court at that time. So these are some of the things we'll be taking these witnesses through and the advocates through before the actual hearing. And I hope by that time, uh, things, will be, things will be okay. Yes, thank you. I would just add, Mr. Chair, on that, um, that we're living in interesting times um, and things which we thought were not possible only a month or two ago, ago are now not only possible, possible, but possibly also inevitable. So yeah, I think the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Uh, I think the court has done a trial run. For them, they've decided to use Microsoft Teams as a platform. Other courts are using other platforms. And I think we will refine as we go along. And I think in addition, it is also about the parties to a case or the counsel to a case, which kind of courtesies they choose to exercise, to exchange with each other, beyond the hard rules uh, in the rules of procedure and in any guidelines that the courts will give. We can actually choose to extend courtesies to each other that will make the virtual trials to be very smooth, exchange documents in advance, give each other good notice, and so on, and we can have very smooth trials. And as it is, at least at the international level, international courts and tribunals, most evidence is written anyway. Most of the time, we have put our evidence in affidavits and annexes to affidavits. Uh, oral uh, trials, oral testimony are the exception rather than the rule. Sometimes, depending on the exigencies of a case, you would insist that you would like to cross-examine. 
you know, a deponent. And many times that deponent is actually an expert witness, either an expert witness on either side or even a senior governmental official. Sometimes, for instance, we are doing a labor case at the East African Court of Justice where an individual employee of the East African community has sued his employer because of the violation of some of his rights. And the employer has then put in affidavit evidence. And we're questioning some of the things that have been put in affidavit evidence based on our knowledge of the EAC. So it's such a person that we are putting on the stand, you know, a senior EAC official for cross-examination. In other cases, you'd find that you had relied on an expert, you know, a doctor, it's a construction contract, it would have been, you know, an engineer or something. So getting to cross-examine those kinds of people, even virtually, I think should be quite easy. So for me, I think the cases have started. Uh, I can't remember, Honorable Registrar, whether you've um, made the facility for streaming the trials off your Facebook page or off live stream or so on, because then it can enable lots of other citizens, council included, to observe the trials that are going on, for instance, this week, next week, and for the rest of the month. And we will refine things as we go along. But I think we've got enough of a framework to go ahead. And if council, uh, parties to a case can extend courtesies to each other. The cases can even go more smoother. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, uh, I'm inviting Kalali Steven. Uh, if he's online, he can uh, make his contribution as we take the final remarks. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, his well, my question is, that first of all, I appreciate the fact that uh, at least there is an online system that has been adopted or upheld by our court system. And uh, I would further pray to your worship that if this initiative can be taken up for the future comings, it could help us a lot. Because we realize that as advocates, some of the clients we represent can hardly meet our transportation and facilitation fees to Arusha. So this kind of system could help in addition to the challenge you say that if the court session cannot be easily shifted to Nairobi, Kampala and other countries, so this system could be a better upgrade in that line. Then secondly, my point in regard to cross-border trade, like we know there is a case I of Rwanda for violating some of the treaty provisions. Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. You are, well, dragging, I was that, you are dragging, but you can proceed, please. Okay, I was saying that uh, on the issue of cross border trade, of recent there is uh, a, a, a reference I failed personally against the Attorney General of Rwanda. And uh, we have also found the difficulties in getting the timelines for schedule, like highlighting on submissions. And I did pose that question to his worship to kindly guide us on what does it take for someone to have uh, his case fixed for highlighting on submissions to have it educated on faster. Because as we understand, the issue of closing the borders affected a lot of individuals from all the respective partner states and we could look at that aspect or reference being among the most urgent matters that could be disposed of easily by by the East African Court of Justice at Arusha. Maybe if you missed out the first one, I was saying that this system, I pray to his worship so that it can be upheld to enable some of our clients that we represent who can hardly meet the costs of transporting the advocates to Arusha, in addition to the time going along to adopt the issue of shifting sessions to different jurisdictions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, uh, so much. Um, Mr. Kalali. Uh, the registrar will give uh, a response to your concerns too and to your contributions as he makes his final remarks. After that, Don will also make his final remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Kalali, in fact, before we even started using a system like this, the court, we were in the process of procuring video conferencing, which were going to be in all our sub-registries. 
And the idea was instead of making lawyers come to Arusha, they were going to go to our sub registries. It's only judges who are going to come to Arusha and we continue the proceedings. Now, of course, COVID came in that even movement is difficult. So we have to connect from whichever point or whichever location you are in, which we are doing successfully. So that is something which, uh, by the time I'm leaving the court, it will be fully operational. On your issue of uh, a date for scheduling uh, highlighting, uh, it still goes back to the number of cases we are receiving, vis-a-vis -vis the number of judges, vis-a-vis -vis the days of judges working, which are 21 days in a month. That is a problem, as I said earlier, we are trying to look into by increasing, having more of allocation of funds to increase the number of, of our dates, the days for hearing, or have the judges permanently in Arusha. Uh, it's not a concern to you only, it's a concern to all of us, as you have seen even from your other colleagues who have raised the issues of uh, certificates. So it is a matter that we are, we, we, are, uh, we are on top of. Now to conclude, I must say that uh, we have been pushing for an amendment of the treaty. And I'll expect councils to come out forcefully on some of these provisions of amendments of the treaty. Sometimes a voice outside is more appreciated than a voice inside. I might say something for, as an insider, nobody will take me seriously. But when the same thing is said by an outsider, it's taken seriously. This is our court. And uh, uh, the treaty is our document. It's called a people-centered document. So let us begin when it comes to that time so that uh, we submit proper proposals on amendment of uh, the treaty. There are many, many provisions that require amendment, uh, as, as you have seen. This, uh, the, the worst one beat the 30, the, the, the 30 days rule. So I look forward to seeing more participation from the legal fraternity in the community when it comes to amending the treaty. The other point, again, which I will encourage uh, is uh, councils taking up public interest litigation at the regional level. Other than uh, ELS and maybe Palu, few lawyers do that, yet there is a lot. There is a lot that can be done in terms of public interest litigation. Uh, to an individual, it will expose you to international litigation. And then on the wider scale, you are helping the, the wider public to benefit out of uh, what has been done. I think those would be my concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you for your invaluable contribution. John, please make your conclusion. Okay. No, I'd also just uh, no, really like to thank uh, the colleagues. I see we ended up being well over 60 people uh, in this call. Uh, some, of course, have dropped off, some have come in and so on. Uh, that shows that there's a level of interest uh, in the community and not just as an esoteric, you know, funky idea to have, but as an important part of the development of our politics, of our economics, of our society, and of uh, our businesses. So uh, I'd just like to thank colleagues. I mean, a few were able to speak. Uh, there have been vibrant questions uh, in the question uh, and answer uh, platform and so on. So let's just continue challenging each other. And as a registrar said, let's make a strong move to make sure that the community works and works for the people. I think as has been said in other fields, in the field of manufacturing, for instance, a lot of our supply chains and our value chains included getting things from China or selling things through China along the manufacturing process. Those value and supply chains have been disrupted. So we really have to look internally within each other, the five, six countries in the context of the East African community and the 55 in total in the context of Africa to see how we can trade more with each other, how we can get the raw materials or the intermediate materials that we need for manufacturing, for trade more from each other. And I think then we'll end up relying more and needing more bodies like the East African Court of Justice to clarify the law, to apply the law and to ensure compliance. Uh, and we hope we'll continue seeing you in this journey. Uh, and I think we can also just uh, continue chatting also on social media on the East African Law Society handles, the Palu handles and so on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are drawing, our, our meeting is drawing to an end. And uh, first, I have to start by thanking each and every one of you for dedicating your times, especially during these challenging times, for making it for this discussion and for your invaluable contribution. I know the time was very short, 
we are planning based on the feedback we are going to get from you uh, master classes on, on, on participation or, or on practicing before the East African Court of Justice. Probably the next session could cover drafting of pleadings and submissions before the court so that we can prepare you in depth on some of the challenges that you'll have to deal with uh, while, uh, while uh, you know, facing the judges. But at this point, please permit me to thank the East African Court of Justice represented by the Registrar, Honorable Yuflani Sokuvo, for his contributions, for his presence, and for agreeing to engage with our members whenever we invite him to. I'm also here to thank Donald Dare and the Pan-African Lawyers Union for their support and collaboration. They've always been an invaluable partner to the East African Law Society as well as to the court. Uh, to our partner, Raoul Wallenberg Institute, who has made it possible for us to go around East African community to sensitize lawyers and other communities on the work of the court, to study the impact of the decisions of the court in the society, and to continue building reputation of the court. We say thank you. And to every National Law Society member of ELS, the Law Society of Kenya, Uganda Law Society, Rwanda Bar Association, Burundi Bar Association, Zanzibar Law Society, and South Sudan uh, Bar Association, and their leadership. We also say thank you for the support and for each one and of you and the team at the East African Law Society led by David Sigano and Elmad for putting this together. We look forward to seeing you soon. And this session was recorded. We are going to make it live from our uh, available on our uh, website and on our web, you know, social media as, uh, pages so that you can go over it, you can watch it, and you can share it with others who may be interested. I wish you a good afternoon. <laughs>